when I started Dynamo, the intent was to rescue, to, to help rescue our allies that got left. Afghan commandos, interpreters, uh, intelligence sources, people that I knew the Taliban were going to hunt and kill. We did that for a long time until we started learning that there's hundreds of Americans that were left. Now, I'm all about rescuing interpreters all day long, and that's great. And we'll do what we can. But the reality is, is our people, you know, there are people in Afghanistan that got a passport that looks just like this. And they're left. And that is the wrong answer. That is the wrong answer every day, twice on Sunday. Welcome to episode 62 of People Are the Answer. I truly believe that people are the only answer to the world's many problems. I'm Jeffrey M. Zucker, a serial entrepreneur here to learn how innovators are creating outsized transformational social impact. Today's episode is a doozy. It features retired Lieutenant Commander Brian Stern, a decorated military veteran and founder of Project Dynamo, an international search, rescue, aid, and assistance organization. Together with his colleagues since 2021, Brian has been able to evacuate nearly 7,000 Americans from life-threatening situations in places like Afghanistan, Ukraine, Russia, and Sudan. He's done all of this on a shoestring budget with no government funding, and is always on the lookout for new donors that can help support and expand their work. This was certainly the most frenetic interview I've done, as during our interview, Brian was in the middle of working near the Sudan-Egypt border with limited time available and pausing to take calls or help a colleague. His life-saving work never pauses. Brian and I discuss his experience at Ground Zero on September 11th, his long military career, how he was motivated to do all that he could to bring Americans home at all costs, and much more. Here is Brian Stern on People Are the Answer. Brian, thanks so much for joining me on People Are the Answer. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I know you've got quite a bit going on right now, so I'm excited to dig in. Uh, can you just start off by telling the audience you know, who you are and what your current role is? Yeah, my name is Brian Stern. I lead a, a non for profit We're a veteran. I lead an advocate called Project Dynamo. We're a veteran-led, donor-funded international rescue organization. We operate in what we call the gray space, which is a... Uh, metaphor, if you will, for working where the U.S. government isn't. So um, uh, we, we rescue people where there's no U.S. embassy if the, if, for whatever reason, be, because they left like in Afghanistan, uh, um, uh, because they left like in Afghanistan, uh, if they're never going to come at all, like in Ukraine, you know, we're never going to send a SEAL team to do a rescue in Ukraine. That's never going to happen. Uh, it, um or until they show up, like in Hurricane Ian, we, we, we were first in the water. Once big resources showed up, we pulled out. We were there for about a week. Uh, we were the first boats in the water during Hurricane Ian. We, we actually beat the Coast Guard. And then in places where where the diplomatic relationship is toxic or ineffective, where things can't happen, places like Russia, where we've done operations on the ground to rescue Americans from Russia. We're the only organization in the world to have ever done a, a, a kinetic operation inside inside uh, Russia proper, where we rescued two American kids from a Russian state-run orphanage in St. Petersburg, and uh, the kids are from Texas, and got them back to Texas. So now that brings us to Sudan. This is now the third country that we're operating in, where their uh, U.S. Embassy closes, they do an evacuation, Americans get stuck, there's no real consular services, there's no, there's no actual, um, no help there per se. Sudan's a little bit different because state is organizing some things, which is great, That's the, that is the right answer. That's great, DOD is uh, working with state uh, to try and get things to happen, but it is definitely clunky and they're doing it remote. So, uh, which presents a whole slew of problems. There, there isn't, there aren't platoons of special forces guys running around escorting Americans to planes and that kind of thing, which leads us to the operation that we just concluded yesterday. Uh, part of what we call Rhino River is is our Sudan uh, portfolio, where we landed the first airplane uh, in Sudan to rescue Americans. Uh, we were the first charter plane to land in the entire country, and we're the first plane to take off and take off with Americans on it. State Department and DOD have only been using boats going to Saudi Arabia. We we landed an airplane, which everyone said we couldn't do, but that's kind of our um, calling card. Every time someone says we can't do something, then um, we say, uh, kind of watch this. 
So uh, Dynamo, we're, we're entirely donor funded. We have no corporate sponsors, although I would love some. So for your audience who's listening, small businesses, big businesses, whoever, uh, I'm actively looking for uh, companies to partner with, sponsor, whatever. Uh, these operations are very expensive, especially when you start talking about airplanes. With our, our uh, this plane that we just did yesterday is a Boeing 737, four hundred and ten thousand dollars to land a 737 in a war zone and rescue eighty six Americans out of a civil uh, out of a brutal civil war with no help from the government whatsoever. So um, that's us. That's us in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. It's really, really incredible work that you do and. Um, look forward to digging in a little further, but I want to learn a little bit more about your background. Um, I know you're overseas right now. Do you have a home base in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I live in Florida, although I haven't really been there a lot in the last two years because um, we, we keep evacuating embassies and people keep getting stuck. So uh, I'm supposed to be on vacation this week. And that's really funny because that was the same thing I said during Hurricane Ian. I was home on vacation from, from the war in Ukraine in October. So uh, I don't get to vacation a whole lot. We've been pretty busy because things keep happening. Well, we appreciate you continuing to work on that. And, um, you know, it's really incredible work that you're doing. Very difficult work. What in life in general motivates you? Um, uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, I joined, I joined the army as a kid and I've been serving the nation and our people one way or the other for my entire adult life. I kind of don't know how to do anything else, to be honest. Um, it sounds kind of funny to say that, but that's, that's kind of the truth. And, um, we're coming, growing up in the, in the intelligence community and the special operations community are, are the, the cardinal rule. The number one rule amongst everything is we don't leave our people behind. That's true for our teams, you know, when, when we're running and gunning as part of an element, whatever that may be, a SEAL team or whatever it is. But that's really, you know, that's really for the people. It's always been that if you have an, if you have an American passport, if you have an American passport and you are in trouble, part of the $1 trillion a year that we all pay in taxes for national security is that, is that if you call for help, People show up. I mean, that's how it, that's what it's always been. No matter, you know, skiing in the Swiss Alps and you break your leg and, you know, you say, hi, my name is Jeff Zucker. I'm an American from wherever you're from. I broke both my legs because I was skiing in the Swiss Alps. And, you know, people, people help. Uh, that's always been what it is up to and including, you know, I, um, you know, N Navy SEALs coming and smoking bad guys to rescue hostages. That's the way it's always been. And for whatever reason, that is not the way it is now. That's a policy thing or a political thing, or I don't know. And honestly, I don't care. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. We're Americans. This is an American issue. I, I ju Just like when someone calls 911, if your house is on fire and you call 911, the dispatcher doesn't say, well, Jeff, did you pay your taxes this year? Or did you vote for the mayor? And how did you... Then I ask that. They say, where are you? What's your problem? We're on the way. That's the way it always has been for America and Americans. And for whatever reason, uh, that's not exactly the case today. Well, we appreciate you filling that gap. And um, where did you spend your childhood? I grew up in New York City. I uh, grew up in New York City. And, um, and I've traveled. Uh, I've been probably 70 countries, I think, something like that. You know, before joining the military, when you were growing up, did you already have the desire to give back? Was there something that you were experiencing as a kid that was like, I want to give back one day? Uh, no, uh, uh, I never really thought about it, but uh, probably quite the opposite. I was a uh, I was a troubled youth. Uh, uh, most of my friends that I grew up with turned into nothing or went to jail uh, or, saw, or got involved in the uh, other thing. You know, the only we used to say the only passport on the street is sports is sports or the military. And I have got the athletic ability of an iPhone, uh, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, but um, uh, yeah, I, I didn't really have a call to serve. I just thought, you know, I joined the army. I, I never planned to make the military a career. I, it was supposed to be uh, do a couple, two, three years, figure it out. Like, I don't know, you know, I didn't really have a big plan. Maybe go to law school. My father was a lawyer. My mother was in business, you know, go, go to law school or something. I, I didn't really have a plan, to be honest. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I joined the Army was do something while I'm figuring it out. I joined uh, before 9-11. So, you know, I'm a pre-9-11 soldier. Um, 
And then, um, of course, 9 11 happened, and I've been busy ever since, really. Well, thank you very much for your service. And, um, you know, I know that you mentioned 9 11. Um, I read that you were at ground zero when the planes hit. You know, what was that like? How were you able to, to help? Yeah, uh, I was uh, I was stationed in New York. I was working. In, I was in the army, working in New York, and um, and uh, um, uh, I came out of the train, and Tower One was already hit. Uh, Tower Two would get hit soon thereafter, and I was kind of in between the two towers when Tower Two got hit. I was in both collapses, uh, both collapses, and um, and um, uh, stayed down there for a couple of weeks, digging in the rubble, and got all banged up, and it was terrible. And uh, people forget, you know, elite, you know, Dynamo, Dynamo, nine eleven is is deeply rooted in uh, in in Dynamo. Nine eleven, it was a seminal moment in my life. People forget, you know, we talk about the fire department, we talk about um, we talk about the fire department, and the police department, FDNY, and all that stuff. People forget the thousands of the original first responders were civilians, just trying to help, just trying to help. So. So um, uh, that's very much Dynamo. That 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 is Dynamo. You know, where I have seventeen volunteers all in at varying levels of commitment, uh, and they're just people trying to help. I have I have MAGA hat wearing Trump folks working side by side with people who have Hillary Clinton for president bumper stickers still on their car, and they work together. It's the best. What's cool about Dynamo? We're the best part of America. It shows that, yeah, politically we may be all screwed up and whatever, and we have differences of opinion on pretty much every little thing. But when it comes to when it comes to uh, American values, uh, where we 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 are Americans, what allows us to be Americans is that we can be different and still get along somehow, and still do things for people and be generous. And generosity is a core component of ca- uh, of, the, of, a, of, a, of any democracy, is what Plato and Aristotle both said. So. Um, that's very much dynamo. You know, that's what I'm so, that's one of the things I'm most proud of. Yeah. I mean, it's tremendous. The type of people that you're able to, to get to work together. And would you say that the thing that brings these polarized groups together is just, you know, the American aspect of helping people and rescuing people? I think so. I, you know, we all, we're all, um, we all have mothers. We all have fathers. We all have people. We all grew up. We're all, you know, we're all different, but we're all the same. You know, uh, you know, everyone puts their pants on in the morning. We all got to eat. We all got to, you know, y- y- I've been all over the world and, and, and a lot and to a lot of really terrible places. And when you talk to people about what they want in life, it's funny how similar we all are. If, you, if you're, you know, if you're in a, in a rock pile in Afghanistan somewhere and I and I've done this where you sit with you sit with a family and say, well, what do you actually want? They say, well, make a little bit of money, put food on the table, raise my children you know, be a good person. Hopefully when I pass away, I don't suffer too much. Yeah. I don't know. I, I can, I say that too. You know, <laughs> I can relate to that, <laughs> you know? So, um, you know, we're all, we're all inhabitants of this little blue planet and I'm not a really lofty kind of guy. Uh, if you read my bio, you know, I'm not exactly a, a beacon of, uh, of hugs and kisses or anything, but um, you know, I've done some pretty terrible things for God and country and uh, and I sleep like a baby. I have no PTSD or any of those issues. But but I recognize that, you know, we do what we need to do. And this work with Dynamo is the same. This is this is helping our country, helping our people who need it when they need it. And no one else is coming. We're the last resort, not the first option. So, so you served, I know you served in Iraq and Afghanistan and could you talk more about, you know, that experience and what eventually led you to starting Project Dynamo? Um, uh, well, I mean, I've, I've been, you know, 25 years of service. We'd be here all day if we went yeah. through my, uh, <laughs> Let's not do that. uh, so yeah, my, my, my career, you know, c- career in the military is, is, uh, complicated, uh, to say the least. Done a lot of cool things with, with uh, the most elite units in the U S arsenal, uh, the, the best of the best and the brightest of the brightest. Um, and, uh, what's interesting is, is all that leads me to dynamo right none, none of the tactics that that we use in dynamo were invented by dynamo this is all stuff that my team and i have years and years and years and decades you know collectively a couple of hundred years of experience 
doing this exact thing for the government. So none of these none of these ideas are are original, if that makes sense, right? Um, you right when we say things like like um, you know how did Dynamo start? Dynamo started simply. I was watching. I was watching the the withdrawal of Afghanistan on TV of the military, and I was like everybody else was, and um, clearly not going well. Clearly, and um, as a guy who's done a lot of these kinds of things over twenty five years, was able to recognize that surely people were going to get left behind, right? And that was August twenty twenty one. August twenty twenty one. As I was watching it on TV, I was actually working on my keynote speech for the 20th anniversary of 9-11, which was just a few weeks later, right? The USM, you know, Kabul fell, Kabul fell August 30th. 11 days later was the 20th anniversary of 9-11. So I, I was sitting in my living room trying to write my speech, right? And watching this on TV and emotional. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan. I buried a lot of friends in Afghanistan. I'm alive today because of the Afghans, not because of the Americans. I work on the street amongst uh, with with the indigenous forces, so to speak. Uh, my interpreter was killed uh, by the Taliban. So I'm watching all this on TV, and I'm distraught. I'm, I'm, you know, it's an emotional thing, right? I've missed, you know, over 20 years of war from the very beginning of the towers coming down. I am intimately involved in this war. You know what I mean? In a very real way. Very, very real way. As I was working, as, as this is all happening, I watched, like we all saw, the C-17, the military plane at Kabul International, take off, and I'm watching people fall from the plane. And I'm like, I, like what? I had this moment of like, what planet am I on? That 20 years later, the last time I saw that was on the morning of 9/11. We're, we're, we're weeks away from the 20th anniversary of 9-11. We went to war in Afghanistan because of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. They're back in town. The Taliban are, are back in control. People are falling. Innocent people are jumping to their deaths as a better idea. We've made no progress. We've made absolutely no progress. And the amount of national treasure in blood and money that has been spent, it cut a hole in my heart that, frankly... Um, you know, I cried first, you know, I got upset. Then I cried. Then I got angry. Then I got passionate. And I said, screw this. Let's go do something. Knowing that it wasn't going well and people are going to get left. When I started Dynamo, the intent was to rescue, to, to help rescue our allies that got left. Afghan commandos, interpreters, uh, intelligence sources, people that I knew the Taliban were going to hunt and kill. We did that for a long time until we started learning that there's hundreds of Americans that were left. Now, I'm all about rescuing interpreters all day long, and that's great. And we'll do what we can. But the reality is, is our people, you know, there are people in Afghanistan that got a passport that looks just like this. And they're left. And that is the wrong answer. That is the wrong answer every day, twice on Sunday. So uh, that's kind of what happened with us. We we went we went forward. So we so that I had this uh, moment of anger. I called my friends, and I said, "This is what we're going to do." Lots of these different groups were formulating in chat rooms and signal rooms, and lots of veterans that are very passionate about this stuff. A lot of guys have been through. A lot of guys have been shot up and tore up and lost their arms and legs, and widows have been made and orphans have been made, all because of this war. So a lot of people are, are very passionate in the veteran community about Afghanistan, and they do the best that they can. What I said was, as well, we can be passionate all day long, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to pack our stuff. We invaded Afghanistan from the north. Everyone's looking at Kabul. We're not going to do that. We're going to pack our stuff and deploy forward and get the band back together. Get one last blast, right? And I told my friends, I got to be home for the 20th anniversary of 9-11. This will only be three weeks long. So no matter what happens, three weeks, Dynamo will come, Dynamo will go. We were asked early on, do we need a website? No, nah, I don't need a website. We'll, we'll what do I need a website for? Really, this is a three-week idea that I'll turn into a dude's trip. We'll help where we can, whatever, right? So we, we deploy forward and start doing land operations and setting conditions for air operations. Subsequent to that, we land the first airplane in Kabul under Taliban rule, broke a lot of, broke a lot of China. 
Uh, we are landing clearance 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 001 of the Taliban. Kind of weird. And um, we've been we've been doing ops pretty much daily ever since then. Ukraine started. We expanded to Ukraine. We didn't pivot. We expanded. Today, today, as I talk to you, we're doing an operation in Afghanistan today. Still, for people Americans that got left today, almost two years later. We're still so we expanded into Ukraine. That became a thing. Then Hurricane Ian happened somewhere in the middle of all that. I came home to do my taxes, did that, and now we've expanded again into Sudan. Well, it's it's just really incredible how you've you've grown with the need uh, of the world. And um, from the stat that I have as of February twenty three is that you'd uh, extracted more than six thousand Americans. Yeah, well, we'll uh, we're trending. Um, I don't want to say that was at 7,000, but, but I, <laughs> we, we, we keep, we keep closing embassies and people keep getting stuck. So I have no way to do pattern analysis. We actually had to change our logo. Our original logo for Dynamo had the map of Afghanistan on it. We had to change our logo to go global. Um, and I've learned the hard way. Don't commit to anything because, uh, things keep happening. <laughs> so you're currently, I believe, working on getting people out of Sudan as, as one of your projects. Is that correct? Correct. What we call Rhino River. Rhino River is the umbrella operation for American uh, American and allies, uh, allied evacuations out of Sudan for the Civil War. And, you know, how's that going and what are some of the, the biggest challenges you're facing? Well, in the rescue world, you only have challenges. It's like 99% fail with uh, 1% uh, success. Is how it goes. That's just the nature of it. Uh, it's not tourism, and we're donor funded, so we have to do all these things on a shoestring budget. We just had a major, major, major success. We landed the first airplane, as I mentioned, uh, in Sudan, which everyone said we couldn't do. We did it. Everyone said you couldn't get a charter plane in. We did that, and we pulled a, we pulled eighty six Americans, uh, Americans, uh, and green card holders out of Sudan yesterday morning. Wow. Well, thank you. Congratulations. If you're enjoying this episode, I would greatly appreciate if you could review, like, comment, or subscribe on your favorite platforms. Your engaged support goes a long way in helping the show grow and getting our impactful guests heard. Now back to the show. And, you know, I, uh, which is almost the amount, the same amount as what the, of what half of, <laughs> that's almost, that's almost the same amount of what DOD did with 100 Special Forces guys to evacuate the embassy. They sent like, you know, 90 guys in to bring 100 embassy staff out. You know, we did it with three people. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. And I know you implied that it's sort of political that you're not able to get government funding for something like this, but it just seems like something that would make sense. Hey, here's some people that are saving Americans. Why not give them government funds? You, you know, we, we have a love-hate relationship with the State Department. Uh, sometimes they love us, sometimes they hate us. Uh, most of the time it's good though, I'll say. The relationship is good. The support is non-existent or, um, or pretty much non-existent uh, other than phone calls and emails. But um, we actually, uh, I had pitched State Department uh, oh, like a year and a half ago when I and I went to them and I said, I'll assume all the risk. I'll do all the work. We'll do all the ops. We'll do everything. We'll do everything. But because they don't really believe that we can do it, which is fine. That's okay. That's, and I get that all the time. I'm used to that one. But I told them, I said, look, if I, if, I, if I go after an American and I pull an American out and I can show you receipts, documentation as to how we did it, the plan, what it cost, will you cover some of the cost afterwards? So only if we're successful. I will, you know, I don't want commission, but, you know, if I eat what I kill and you can you subsidize us after the fact. And they said, no, seems like a so, fair ass. Uh, <laughs> Jeez. I, 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 you, you know what I mean? Uh, like, you know, during, during, um, there was not the operation to, to rescue captain Phillips during the Marist Alabama hostage situation in Somalia. That operation cost the, cost the taxpayers $111 million in a weekend, complete with a parachute jump, a bunch of Navy ships, helicopters, and a Tom Hanks movie. Right, <laughs> one hundred eleven million bucks and money well spent. That's like budget dust for the U.S. government. That's nothing. That's the rounding error for lug nuts on the F thirty five. Right, no big deal. 
you know, my entire operating budget all in, we're, we've been, we're like under 5 million bucks. It's nothing. It's nothing. So from a cost, from a, you know, we're, we're cost efficient. Yeah. I mean, imagine what a few more dollars could do. <laughs> what a really good deal. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't know why that is. Uh, we get no recognition from the government. Not a, not a single, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, Ellen DeGeneres got the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and uh, we can't get a thank you note of the State Department. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's truly remarkable in a bad way, and um, hopefully that changes. And at the least, you know, hope you guys are able to find you know a lot of additional funding because it sounds like you're incredibly efficient with your dollars, um, and it's amazing to see. Uh, the work is is unbelievable, and um, you know during rescues, I've read that you know it sounds like an action movie that I'm reading about using disguises, getaway cars, encrypted devices, safe houses, traps. Um, can you talk about you know that in general, and if there's any particularly interesting stories that you think the viewers would be interested in? The, the interesting, I get asked the interesting story one all the time. I, I get that, and I also get uh, is there one rescue that sticks out? And the reality is they're all special, every single one. It's, it's not baking a cake, right? We're, we're not McDonald's making burger, you know, making, making Big Macs, where it's, you know, okay, add the piece of cheese and two pieces of tomato and a bun. Um, they're all unique and different. And what's also different about Dynamo is that we do the operations ourselves. So of the, of the 6,000 people that we've rescued, a good 4,000 of them or so are in my cell phone. I mean, I, we're... Where, you know, we, we, I'm looking at, you know, my team and I are looking in their eyeballs, um, you know, so we, we, uh, we, we know these people, uh, we get to meet with them. I've laughed with them. I've cried with them. Um, I, I've got, um, uh, nobody wakes up and says, you know, I hope to be rescued. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine, uh, who's actually in the room with me right here. Um, a guy that we helped get out of Sudan yesterday and, um, his words to me, which I've heard a thousand times, I can't believe this is happening to me. No, you know, it's, it's one of those, how did I wind up a refugee? You know, um, I get that. I've got hundreds of those stories. We've, we've broken Americans out of jail. Uh, crazy stories. We, uh, on more than one occasion, <laughs> repeated from Russian intelligence, the most sinister intelligence service on planet earth that thinks it's a good idea to use biotoxin in England you know, these are pretty serious people, and um, we've hustled them, uh, not negotiated, I might add, uh, not negotiated. We've done that, too. We, we've uh, So we've done some really, really, really wild, um, crazy, you know, kind of larger-than-life things. And one of, the th one of the cool things about Dynamo, which I, very few people think that it's cool but me, but I think it's awesome, is when I used to do this stuff for the government, I couldn't tell anybody about it. I've done lots of these over 25 years, crazy stuff. I mean, real crazy, you know, you know, crazy. There's some cra really scary things out there that we've stopped, you know. Dynamo was completely private, so I get to record everything and tell everybody about it, which is really funny. So the, the Russians sent a hitman to kill me in May. We got we got his face on video and we got the whole thing on video and it was really surprising to, to him that he thought that we were they, they thought we were walking into their ambush with jokes on them they walked into my ambush and i got to put that right on tv and make the russians crazy i thought it was hysterical <laughs> i thought it was funny <laughs> made them nuts <laughs> I'm glad you're able to find the humor in it because it certainly sounds terrifying to me to to have a hitman hired to to kill you. So, um, but I'm I'm glad you're able to make the most of it. And you know, I I'm curious: Are you planning with some of the the content that you've been able to gather to turn it into a documentary or anything like that to sort of share the work that you guys have been doing? I don't know. We we talk about it all the time. Um, we talk about it all the time, but like I don't know. I'm not. I'm in this to save lives, honestly. I the only reason why I do any media at all is for fundraising. We're, we're, we're donor funded, and unless people know, I can't raise money. That's the only reason. That's the, that's the only reason why um, why I'm why I do it at all. Yeah, that I, that makes sense. Um, I, I also read that there's there are Russians that refer to you as Volshevnik, which is the magician or wizard. Where did that come from? <laughs> 
<laughs> Who told you that? <laughs> uh, my research, <laughs> my producer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Valshavnik. Valshavnik in Russian means uh, the wizard or like the magician, like the magician. Um, uh, that comes from um, – just hold on for one second. I got a guy coming up. I'm sorry. It's just a pause. One second. Nothing works in this country. Nothing works in this country. Well, at least the internet's working at the moment. Hey, hey, hey Juan is coming down to uh, Juan is coming down to get you. Are you in the lobby? Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, we're we're sitting in uh, the coffee shop where we met the first time. Perfect. Look for look for Juan, the Colombian. He's he's coming down to get you, and he'll bring you up to the room. I'm just doing uh, doing a few things, so just come on up and hang out. Okay, I'll be there in a minute. Oh, oh, but he'll he'll bring you up. He'll bring you up. All right. Okay. So. Uh, yeah, So Valshavnik comes from the uh, the Detroit Lions operation, which is uh, his, the kid's real name is Eddie Eddie Alexandrov, or he goes by Carrillo. Uh, Carrillo is an American citizen from Lansing, Michigan, who was arrested by the Russians uh, April 2022 on 11 counts of espionage, uh, which is fake. Um, he was he was arrested for espionage and, and a bunch of other crimes. He was uh, held for 37 days. He was beaten and tortured pretty much every day. Mock executions, um, drugged, probably uh, all kinds of stuff. His wife was also arrested. She was brutalized. She's about four foot six and looks about 16, 15 years old, as you would imagine. And uh, the Russian army and Russian intelligence did some pretty terrible things to her also. He was put on his knees almost every day, and they didn't do – they put a gun to his head. They didn't do click. They did bang, and it would fire a bullet past his ear. Uh, then they would beat the crap out of him and make him dig holes and all kinds of stuff. So pretty terrible uh, set of circumstances. He's the first victim – he's the first American, American victim of war crimes alive since World War II. Okay? So it starts. So we find out about him through his mother. Uh, thank God we had contact with him before he got arrested, trying to get him out. As soon as we had contact, he was, he was arrested very quickly after we had a conversation with him. Uh, they were already looking at him. He was already on the bad boy list and he was getting ready to be rolled. In the world of, uh, so now he's arrested and, uh, by Russian intelligence, by the FSB, which is pretty sinister. Uh, these are the same guys that arrested Brittany Griner. These are the same people that do all kinds of terrible things. Um, interrogated the whole thing. So in the world of hostages, it's always better to negotiate a release. It's safer, better, easier sometimes, right? Especially if the kid's a nobody, which he is. Um, um, it, it's, just a, it's just more amicable, right? Than doing uh, some sort of hit or ruse or hustle or scam or Whatever, it's just better if everyone's on the same team. So what happens is for 37 days, we negotiate. Uh, about halfway through those 37 days, we uh, right on the 18th of April, we have an agreement. We make an agreement with the bad guys and everyone's on the same page. But they won't let him go. The people that are actually holding him won't let him and his wife go. Even Moscow said, yep, we've looked. He's nothing. We all agree he's nothing. And it's a very complicated story how we got to that. But bottom line is he's a nobody and they know that he's a nobody and they still won't let him go. While this is happening, I'm not more than 30 minutes away from him at any given time, uh, but I can't get to where he's at. So we're negotiating, 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 and now frustrated, right? What the Russians did not know was that and I negotiated for 37 days talking to a number of people. What the Russians did not know was that at the same time, I was planning uh, what we call a unilateral operation, which is give me my guy back. We take him. He's not, you know, there's one way where he gets released and there's the other way where I take him, right? They didn't know that I was doing both. I think that they probably thought I was or thinking about it, but it's incredibly difficult, so they probably didn't think I had a shot. Mind you, he's incarcerated, so there's that. Uh, and on uh, on Victory Day, uh, on May 9th in Russia, 
it's victory day in Russia is kind of like veterans day, Memorial day and July 4th all rolled into one. So it's a huge, big holiday in Russia where everything stops. It's a big national pride military day. Uh, the president, uh, the president Putin is going to give a big speech as he always does. There's always a you know, flyover with hundreds of aircraft and parades in the streets. It's a huge deal. Uh, that's when we did this. So on victory day, as Putin stepped to the microphone, we stole him from custody of Russia to the extent that uh, this is where the Volshabni thing comes from. It took us a day or it took us a day to get him from where he was kind of all the way through after victory day, Moscow called and we have it all recorded. It's really, really, really funny. Uh, Moscow calls and says, okay, now that the holiday is over, we had stopped negotiations for the holiday. Now that the holiday is over, let's continue Let's continue working this issue. And I said, I closed this case. And they said, uh, they said, um, well, what do we do with Carrillo? And I said, I already have him. And they say, well, but yeah, 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 but what do we do with Carrillo? And I say, I already have him. And they go, yeah, 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 but what do we do with Carrillo? And I go, stop talking and listen. I'm looking at him right now. I have him already. And they say, they call me Boris. And they say, Boris, you have been an honorable man a gentleman this entire time. Now we're so close. Now's not the time to play stupid games. We're, we're so close. We've been doing this for 37 days. We're so close. And I go, look, guys, you know what I look like because I know you know what I look like between media and TV and my file at FSB headquarters or whatever, right? And they go, da, 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 da. And I go, you know what he looks like because you guys sent me his proof of life picture of him holding up a sign. And they go, da, da, da. And you, you know and I know that I've never met him before. And they go, da, 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 da. I go, hold on one second. And I bring Corolla next to me and I take a picture. I take a selfie with WhatsApp. We go, boom. And I go, open up your, I go, open up your WhatsApp. And you hear them go, oh, oh, oh my God. Oh, 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 oh my God. What? What? Oh, 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 my God. And I go, yeah, we're already in Poland already. We're halfway to Warsaw. We're on our way. Um, you, you know, we're 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 halfway we're halfway to Warsaw. I'll call you next week for other cases. I hang up the phone and we gotta go. We gotta go. So what happens is they go and check on him, and his jail cell is well, it was not really his jail cell. Where he was being held, he wasn't really held in a jail cell proper. It's all kind of manufactured. Um, where he was being, they go to check on him, and he is gone, and they can't figure out. They still have his passport today. He's an escaped fugitive as we speak. As we speak, so, um, so, uh, so anyway, um, they are kind of mystified and befuddled. And you know, imagine, you know, imagine if you had, if, you know, if the FBI had a, a Russian spy that they were holding, and they went to go bring him a cup of coffee, and the jail cell was empty. Those FBI guys would have a lot to answer for. So I see. What, and see where they call you the magician. Fifty, fifty-seven Russian checkpoints, not a single piece of paper. I mean, nothing. So imagine in a traffic stop, you get stopped by a traffic cop and they pull you over. They say, license and registration. Sorry, I don't have any. Well, whose car is this? Not mine. Don't know. And you don't speak the language, by the way. So you're saying this in Russian, right? So in Russian, I got no idea. I got no idea. But what happened? And you're famous. And you're famous. He's the, he was the only American spy in the whole region. So everyone knows who he is and he's covered in tattoos. So he sticks out like a sore thumb. Yeah. So that's where Valshavni came from because they, they um, couldn't understand how we did it. And they still don't know how we, <laughs> they still don't know how we did it. They, they swear that I took him out by water, which is not true. I tell everybody it's not true. We went by land. They think I took him out of the Dnipro river and that's how we defeated the checkpoints. I tell them that's not true at all. And uh, they don't uh, they don't believe that. But at the same time, the bad guys um, also sent to hit me and to kill me because they were very angry, <laughs> as you would imagine. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm, I'm very glad you're still with us. You know, fascinating cases. You mentioned like Brittany Griner's case, which was very, you know, talked about in the media. What about people like Paul Whelan and Evan Gershkovich who are, are still stuck over there? You know, 
what can people do? Is there stuff that you're doing on those or are those just in the government hands? Yeah, we're, we're, uh, so we're working on all those cases. We worked on Brittany Griner as well. Uh, we're working Paul Whelan. We're working Evan and uh, a number of other Americans that are, that are unlawfully detained. Um, those are largely government to government um, issues that have to get worked out, largely. That said, because we're not government, very often I'm able to have conversations with people that the government can't have, right? If the, the government has to follow protocol and procedure, and there's a, you know, when governments, to go, you know, secretaries of state talk to ministers of foreign affairs, you know, and presidents talk to presidents and colonels talk to colonels, and, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, um, uh, we don't have that problem. I could talk to anybody without, as long as I can get to them, I can have a, you know, if I can get Vladimir Putin on the phone, we could have a conversation and say, all right, brother, how do we, how do we uh, have this little problem as friends? You know, uh, I don't know, to the record, I don't know Vladimir Putin, but I would take the phone call though. I would, I would, I'd, I'll talk to anybody to save a life and I'll do most anything to save a life further still. So um, we're, we're working on those cases. We're trying, but it's very difficult. The more political those things get, the harder it becomes, the more public it gets. Um, uh, that becomes harder. You know, Kirill Alexandrov is a name not known to you. He actually has more charges against him than Paul Whelan. Paul Whelan has one count. Kirill had 11 counts. But no one ever heard of Kirill Alexandrov, so we were able to do a little bit more. We were to be more effective than, uh, than what Paul Whelan. Got it. Well, you mentioned some of your volunteers earlier. You know, if someone listening is like, I want to volunteer for Project Dynamo, you know, what, what do they do? Uh, most of my volunteers help with all the back end stuff. Uh, case man we have case managers who work with the families who uh, um, collect all the data that we need you know the, this flight that we just did out of Sudan uh, you know 86 people we need their passports and their pedigree information and their contact info and talk to their families and kind of organize them and manifest them and you know almost like an expedient where I always tell everyone we're like the worst travel agency in the world you know I don't know where you're going, and I don't know when when you're going either. But I promise you're going somewhere soon, and hopefully it's not terrible, right? And wherever you are, I promise is worse than where you're going. That's the only assurances I make. So, um, but you know, being able to legally, we don't break the law ever, ever, ever. I don't break the law of any country ever, ever, ever. No matter what is ever, uh, uh, no matter what's said, we one of the geniuses of Dynamo, uh, genius pieces of Dynamo is we figure out a way to operate within the confines of the laws of all these places. And if that means towing a line, we'll tow a line. We'll never cross a line. Um, but yeah, as an example, our operation, uh, I stole these two kids for an orphanage in St. Petersburg. I did that uh, Thanksgiving week, uh, Thanksgiving week, 2022, um, baby Benjamin and baby Elizabeth. They, these kids were born uh, genetically, they're American. They were born to a surrogate, a Ukrainian surrogate mother who was trapped in the war zone with twins. She couldn't get through the front lines, fled south into Crimea, went up into St. Petersburg and gives birth uh, as a surrogate. She's basically the baby oven. Uh, the family had been trying to have babies for seven years. Uh, they did IVF and they did sperm donor, egg donor and all kinds of things. And they could never, it just couldn't work. So uh, they did. They elected surrogates. The surrogate mommy gives birth to two genetically, by blood, genetically American babies. Surrogate pregnancy is illegal in Russia, so that's a problem. She's a Ukrainian in Russia, so that's a bigger problem. So she gives birth and then disappears. And now you have two American babies that are abandoned in Russia, with a birth certificate with the Ukrainian's mother. She then there's two American babies with a Russian birth certificate on, with a Russian birth certificate with a Ukrainian birth mother on it, but meanwhile, they're American. They get put into a Russian state-run orphanage, and Russian law says that in order to be orphaned out of the orphanage, adopted out, they can only be adopted out to Russian citizens. So these two, Amer so this American mommy and daddy, after years of trying to make a family, good news, your surrogate was got pregnant in a war zone, so that's cool, and good news, your kids have been abandoned and are in the Russian orphanage system, so that's great. And there's no administrative mechanism to get them. You can't even adopt them if you wanted to administratively from Russia. 
That's how the story starts. And those kids are sitting in Texas as we speak. It's amazing. Um, and I didn't break a single law. I didn't break a single law. I'm not even going to dig into how that's possible, but I appreciate that for sure. <laughs> 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 Made the front page of the Moscow Times, Vladimir Putin had a canary. They actually changed laws. In It was so elegant operationally. Vladimir Putin that week, that happened on Tuesday, right? That happened on a Tuesday. It's Thanksgiving week. I told the family, buy tickets. They lived in Texas. I go, buy tickets. We, were, we based out of Estonia. The Sunday before, I told them, buy tickets. You'll be celebrating Thanksgiving as a family. And they said, look, Brian, we appreciate it. This, the State Department, CIA, and everyone worked on this thing for 90 days. The kids were born September 5th. This is November 20-something, right? For 90 days, State Department, CIA, Tony Blinken's office, everyone really trying, really, really, really trying. And they couldn't move it. We planned for 11 days and did operations for 13 hours and got the kids out. Before we crossed the border and before everything started, I told the family, look, we're in we're in nowhere Estonia. Don't make the mistake. They're hard to get. It's hard. It's Thanksgiving week. Hard to get plane tickets. I'm celebrating Thanksgiving with my family. I'm telling you, you will be celebrating Thanksgiving with your kids. Buy tickets. And they said, look, Brian, we appreciate your enthusiasm. You're clearly passionate. You clearly talk a good game. But if the entire State Department, if the entire U.S. government and the entire CIA couldn't do it, thank you for trying, and we hope it works out, but our faith isn't really there. And I said, this is the part when I get to say I told you so. And uh, Tuesday morning, 1 a.m., we crossed from Narva, Estonia, into St. Petersburg, Russia. Uh, that was 1.30 in the morning. The kids were in mommy's arms by dinner. Wow. It's really incredible. And just then, they didn't buy tickets and had to do Thanksgiving in Estonia. <laughs> that Wednesday, Vladimir Putin, uh, we made the front page of the Moscow Times. Uh, Putin went crazy. He called a, an emergency uh, an emergency session of the Duma, which is like a Russian Congress, Russian Parliament. They changed a bunch of laws because they didn't break any laws. I used their laws against them. And he changed a series of laws, hoping to mitigate this from ever happening again. And by Friday, that same week, the way we did it would not have been possible. But I didn't break the law. It's it's tremendous. And honestly, some of the, these stories are leaving me somewhat speechless just because they're so incredible and unbelievable. And, um... and, and we document everything for proof because no one believes anything I say. <laughs> No, that's huge. And um, so, you know, you've done all this incredible work to help people all over the world. And I'm curious, like throughout your, your career, or even as you've been building Project Dynamo, is there anyone that's kind of been a mentor to you? Uh, I, I am here today because of my mentors. I'm, I'm classically trained. Uh, I'm classically trained. I'm a pre 9-11 guy. So I grew up um, um, with the, with the, you know, my, I was a, uh, I was 22, 22, 23, and my partner uh, uh, was a guy named Phil, who was 68 years old, and he was my partner, and uh, um, uh, there's a, a slew of them, a slew of them, um, names I can't say because for their protection, because of issues, but um, uh, uh uh, a guy named Gary, a guy named John, a guy named David, a guy named uh, Mike Wall, who's now dead, Billy Waugh, who's probably the greatest, greatest American that ever lived. He, he just passed away. Um, a, a slew of them who tend to be really old <laughs> uh, or older, I should say. I, I, you know, but um, I grew up with I grew up in this community with with guys who fought the Cold War who worked against real big boy targets with little resources. These guys fought and hunted and killed bad guys globally without Instagram, without iPhones, without technology, without um, email. You know, uh, um, you know, when I was, when I went to my first Intel, uh, my, my first Intel training I ever did, I, I was on a typewriter. Right. So being able to operate in these environments with no resources, no backup, no help, no mommies, no daddies, no net, 
no no f sixteens to come and back me up um, communicating in ways that are discreet and and uh uh, maintain security and, and the old school way of doing things is what keeps us floating. There's a whole generation of, of guy out there who, if you take away their iPhones and their computers, they're kind of stuck. They, they, you know, I mean, if you're, you know, you're a journalist, you know, if, if you had a, if I took away your laptop and took away your cell phone, how effective would you be? Yeah. Not so much. Right. Well, journalists existed before, uh, you know, before laptops and cell phones, surely. So it can be done. It can be done. But I would argue that your average journalist out there in 2023 probably would struggle a little bit if I took away their phones and email and laptops. That would be a challenge. Yeah. We've, we've all been become very accustomed to our resources, 100%. I, I grew up the I grew up with old guys who never had any of that stuff, so I'm kind of purpose built for this current for this current. All right, so I've got one last sort of big question for you that I ask every guest. If you could snap your fingers and fix one thing in the world, what would it be, and how do you think that change would reverberate? Uh, I'm going to take one from like the Miss Universe or Miss Miss America thing, world peace. I I, I pray. Uh, I'm not a religious man at all. Uh, at all. I believe in something. I don't know what that is exactly, but I believe in something for sure. But, but you know, uh, I'm spiritual, not religious. But I would gladly, gladly, I, I give my life if necessary to end all this conflict and all this stuff to bring every American home. I'm, uh, I, um, uh, it, it, um, if I could, if, if, if there was a genie and I had one thing, that's what it would be. And this, the number two thing, which is not really realistic, in fairness, the number two thing would be, would be get some sort of, uh, some sort of uh, either government or big corporate monster foundation company, whatever, you know, the Carnegie Foundation or the Rolex Foundation or whatever. Uh, yeah, I wear a Submariner wherever I go because it's uh, good luck. Um, that somebody to subsidize us. I love doing the operations and we're really, really, really good. Really good. Really good. Um, the, the work that we're able to do and the effect that we're able to have is truly amazing. 6,000 people and counting. Every one of those people have friends and mommies and daddies and kids and brothers and sisters and uncles and aunts and dogs and cats. You know, in the world of six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, it's probably two, 300,000 people that we've touched directly or tangentially, right? I wish that I never met a single one of them. But if 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 it's going to be the way, then I would love some help. I would just love some help. Um, um, Understood. And, and hopefully the connection to or that right resource is listening and, and interested in helping because I think the work that you're doing is absolutely tremendous. And for those listening that really want to support you and Project Dynamo and your impact, you know, what is the best steps step for them to take? Uh, two things. One, on our website, projectdynamo.org, projectdynamo.org. Say it again, projectdynamo.org. Um, click the donate button. There's a big red button that says donate now. It's a clue. We're 501c3. We're tax deductible. We take wires, credit cards, Venmo, all kinds of stuff. Um, and then number two, uh, we do a lot of stuff on social media to raise awareness and to raise money. So like us on Facebook, like us on Instagram, and share our stuff widely. Number one, it helps me with awareness. Number two, it helps me with fundraising. And number three, it makes the bad guys crazy, which I love doing. So um, um, uh, please like us on Facebook. We, we put some real fun, fun video. It's all real. Most of the footage on there I've shot on my iPhone. So uh, uh, we put a lot of real fun stuff on there, some real heartbreaking stuff on there, and some real success, uh, some real big. Well, well, we will make sure to share all those links in the show notes. And you know, lastly, like from here, uh, you're in the middle of of working right now. Where are you going when we hang up here? What what's your next step? Probably Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, or Aswan, Egypt, on the border of Sudan. We have a number of right now. We have a uh, an American and her son who are stuck between they're out of Sudan, but before Egypt and they're being literally eaten alive. They've been outside for six days and six nights with no food, no water. They're being eaten alive by bugs and rats. The kid has uh, a number of rat bites on him and um, uh, he's adopted. So his passport isn't 
perfect. And so we're going to go and grab them up and uh, bring them to America. And then we have a whole ton of Americans that are stuck still in Sudan. And I need to uh, deal with deal with those also because uh, State Department stopped all ground convoys and they can't figure out a way to land a plane and the boat doesn't hold a lot of people. Brian, thank you so much for joining us, for taking the time in the middle of your incredible work that you're doing to bring Americans home. Um, we're so thankful for what you're doing. So thankful you gave us the time. Excited to share your story with our listeners. Um, and thanks again. My thanks for listening to this episode of People Are the Answer. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with friends and reviews or subscriptions on your favorite platforms go a long way to help the show grow. I want to share these incredible people and their remarkable work with as many others as possible. Thanks for your support. For more, go to peoplearetheanswer.com.